Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I I am quite audible, I think. So we will get started. Um, we have the one person. Please pray for us and commit this class into the Lord's hands. After that, we will uh, begin our class. Father God, we are grateful for this new day. Thank you for the time you're giving us to receive from you. Through the books of this Old Testament, we want to pray that you keep our hearts and mind open. You lift off everything of sluggishness and sleep, Father. Indeed, we pray that you guide us and lead us, even as you um, anoint and bless um, Pastor Deepika as she takes us through this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. So, um, Today, we will be looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the original goal was to fit both Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon into one single class. Uh, but I think it would be good for us to dwell a little bit on Ecclesiastes, because um, not much generally is taught uh, on this uh, book. Uh, so next class, maybe we would um, take about half the class for uh, Song of Solomon and then the other half for the book of Isaiah. Uh, so yeah, so this week we are going to be looking at um, Ecclesiastes. So if you were to you know, turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes and we were to look at the very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, that is basically where the writer of the book introduces himself uh, with these words, the words of the teacher son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, and even later on, somewhere in the book, he again repeats that he is the king. Uh, so from this, we know uh, that this person who is writing is a uh, son of David, or at least a descendant of David. Uh, he's somebody who is on the uh, Davidic throne. OK, so he's, he's a king uh, and not just simply a teacher. But that's basically how he introduces himself in this book. He refers to himself as the teacher. The Hebrew word over there is Koheleth. Um, so he introduces himself uh, to his audience as the Koheleth, the teacher. Um, now, of course, some people hold that it is Solomon himself who is writing this. Uh, but then based on the kind of um, Aramaic that is used, you know, in many, many of the phrases which have Aramaic origin, um, uh, Hebrew words, of course, but then these Hebrew words are all very, um, have a very uh, Aramaic connotation. Uh, so based on that, some people say this cannot be Solomon. It's probably one of the other descendants of uh, David. So we are not very sure who, uh, which king, uh, which Davidic king wrote this particular book. Uh, however, uh, it's not very important for us to know his identity. What is very important and what is very relevant is the message which he conveys in this uh, book. Um, the wrong idea that generally prevails in the minds of people regarding this particular writer and regarding this particular book is that um, it's offering the perspective of, of a person who is very tired of life. Uh, that it's offering the perspective of someone who has you know, almost given up hope uh, in life. Uh, that's the generally uh, wrong impression that is, that is held in people's minds regarding this book. However, the truth is that this book is being written by a very wise man um, you know, who has lived a long life. And now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and filled with the divine hope which comes from God, he is writing about um, the very um, negative things which we see in this world. Uh, you know, um, it, it's a fact, it's a reality that we live in a fallen, sinful world. And as a result of that, um, uh, we are not exactly experiencing heaven on earth as yet. You know, uh, there are trials that we go through, there are difficulties that we face. Uh, let me see if I can uh, mute this um, person. I'm unable to uh, mute. Uh, you know, if, uh, if the student Shubham could mute himself, 
Pastor, it would be of great help. Pastor Chirin Uncle Bob. So, uh, Pastor Bob, I believe that we are going to wear the video. Okay. I think this has affected my transmission. Um, yeah, um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, yes, um, as I was saying, um, so the, the, the this teacher, uh, he uh, he's most probably writing it, you know, in his old age. Uh, so if it is Solomon, it, it, it is Solomon writing it um, after having gone away from God and having repented and after having come back to God. So now in his old age, he is writing or it is another descendant who is writing and they want to share their learning with us uh, on how to understand this life uh, that we are living on this earth. Um, so um, the wrong idea about this book uh, actually comes out of the fact that one particular phrase uh, in this book has been um, wrongly understood and wrongly translated uh, by most people. And it's the word which occurs 38 times in this particular book of Ecclesiastes. It's the Hebrew word Hevel, H-E-V-E-L. And uh, uh, that book, uh, that particular word, um, it, it literally in Hebrew, it, it means vapor, you know, water vapor. Uh, and that has been translated differently in uh, different versions. So um, the idea is of steam, of, uh, of, of vapor. You know, if you were to boil water and uh, the boiling hot water begins to uh, turn into steam, and even as it's evaporating, you can literally see the water vapor with your eyes. Uh, but but you can't touch it. Uh, you can't hold it. You know you can only uh, see it even as it um, just kind of merges into the invisible. Uh, you know uh, yeah, into the into the invisible portion in front of you. Uh, it, it's the same if you're on a mountain top. You know in in a cold hill station. Uh, you can literally see the mist around you. You know, you have this whitish mist uh, floating all around you. Uh, but then if you try to catch it, uh, if you try to hold it in your hand, uh, you can't. It just vaporizes. Uh, so that uh, phrase is used in different ways in, uh, you know, in the Hebrew language. And over here, uh, the writer uses this particular word uh, to express um, uh, to describe how life is uh, on this earth okay so um, th that's the term that is used so um, in the nkjv the word vanity is used uh, to to translate this uh, original word hevel and that word vanity it means uh, something that's useless uh, and uh, it's probably not a very correct translation uh, in the NIV, uh, that word hevel is translated as meaningless, you know, something which has no meaning, no purpose. And again, I think that is a wrong uh, way of describing this word. Um, in the NASB, uh, the word is described as futility, you know, something that's just ineffective. Again, um, that does not bring out uh, what the writer is actually wanting to say. So this word is very central to this book uh, because the teacher begins his discussion with that uh, with that phrase and he ends his discussion with that phrase uh, so in uh, right in the beginning of course in verse 1 he introduces himself as the teacher and then in verse 2 is where you know he um, makes that opening statement and he says in ecclesiastes 1 2 uh, if, you know uh, i'm just reading out from the niv where the word meaningless is used. Uh, so uh, if you were to translate that word hevel as meaningless, uh, this is basically how it would uh, read in English. Uh, so uh, in Ecclesiastes 1.2, it says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Um, 
and this very same phrase you know this this very phrase uh, same statement is again repeated at the end of the discussion in he ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 8 and then after that uh, statement is made the closing statement is made there are another six verses um, in which he uh, the 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 teacher gives a final piece of advice and that's basically how the book closes uh, so we will look at wh what the correct understanding of the word is um, so uh, would the teacher under the inspiration of the holy spirit have said about life you know the life that we are all living down here in, the, in this um, in this very difficult fallen world would the teacher under the inspiration of the holy spirit have declared and said oh this life is meaningless it is useless it is ineffective that is simply not what the lord would ever say i mean imagine if you were to if you were holding a newborn baby in your hands and then you look at that little baby and you talk to it and you say you know welcome into this world little one and you know what you entered into a world which is completely meaningless how absurd a statement that would be i mean god has not placed us here in this world uh, and declared oh your life is going to be meaningless or useless or ineffective no he has a purpose for us he has hope for us he has a future for us in fact he has eternity in mind for us so this is not a correct way of looking at this uh, at this term hevel and because people have taken this to be the meaning of this word this entire book has now been translated uh, with this particular word in mind you know with, with, with this kind of with, with this kind of a negative meaning in mind and it blocks what the teacher is actually trying to convey so yes we will look at what the actual meaning of this word is supposed to be uh, first we will look at a um, verse ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 if we could have someone read out this verse for us in whichever version. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, please. Any volunteers? Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, please. Uh, I'm not very sure if the students are present or not. If anyone is there, please, if he, you could unmute. He, yes. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into, into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Yeah, so this is there are two uh, things which the uh, teacher is saying here. First, he says that the Lord has put eternity in the human heart. But at the same time, even though he has put eternity in the human heart, humans are not able to understand everything that God has done. OK, so uh, in the NIV, it says he has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So there is a kind of limitation to human understanding, which we see over here. Um, the unique thing about humans is that God has put eternity in our hearts. Um, uh, we have an awareness of time. Um, this is something which you know the creatures don't have, uh, animals and insects do not have, um, you know, uh, to okay let us uh, you know take the example of a cockroach you know let's say there's a roach crawling along the table and then you push it off the table and it falls onto the ground and then it continues to crawl along i mean did it even uh, occur to the roach that it has now suddenly changed location and it's now in a new location does it even uh, you know reflect and ask itself oh, okay now where am i headed which direction am i going in or does it even ask itself, if I had remained on the table, what would my destiny have been? And now that I have moved to a new location on the floor, now what will my destiny be? It has no um, idea of these things uh, because there is no concept of eternity in its heart. 
but we humans have been created uniquely in the very image of god just like god himself we have an awareness of the past we have a very acute awareness of the present of what we are going through right now and we are so aware of the future even those who don't believe in the existence of god you know who say that they are atheists they too look ahead to a future and they wonder what is awaiting them in the days ahead and in fact sometimes they may they may wonder after death is there something more you know is something more uh, awaiting me so these are things which we humans think about because we have been created in the very image of god and um, so therefore we humans we ask ourselves a lot of questions a, a rat or a roach will not really even ask itself questions like this we on the other hand are always constantly thinking reflecting on life and all the things that are that have been placed in this life and all the things which are you know uh, happening to us um, uh, for instance uh, here is one example in ecclesiastes 2 um, actually the entire passage would be 17 to 23 but then maybe we can just look at one small portion of this passage ecclesiastes 2 and if we could have someone read out for us verses 17 to 20 ecclesiastes 2 17 to 20 please therefore i hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for all is vanity and grasping for the wind then i hated all my labor in which i had toiled under the sun because i must leave it to the man who will come after me and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool yet he will rule over all my labor in which i toiled and in which i have shown myself wise under the sun this is also this also is vanity so uh, here you have this person who has worked hard his whole life to achieve something and he is you know um, proud of what he has accomplished but now even though he's he's done so much and put in so much hard work once he dies all of this is going to go to another person and who knows whether that other person is going to be you know committed and sincere whether he's going to have the capability uh, to build on what has already been achieved or will he just simply waste it all away and then all the hard work which this man the first man has put in would just be wasted so um a uh, a uh, uh, a human thinks about these things on the other hand if you were to take the example of an ant you know the ant spends its entire lifetime gathering food but it never really asks itself all this hard work that i'm putting in what is going to be my final destiny is there going to be a reward for you know what i have uh, done this uh, so far the ant does not ask itself uh, what about after i die will the other ants who come after me will they be sincere you know will they take care of this food which i have gathered together and use it wisely it does not even think about eternal things on the other hand humans they want their life to count they want their life to amount to something the things which they have done the things which they have worked hard for they want those things to mean something they would like to have a purpose in life so there's a great distinction between us humans and the other creatures that god has created so uh, the teacher here poses all of these questions and there are and around the end of the book um i think it is in um, ecclesiastes chapter 12 uh in one of the last verses he says um wait let me just actually turn to that because i've not written it down here in my notes um yeah i think it is in uh, verses verse 11 um ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 11 he says that you know all these um reflections all these things which he the wise man and others like him all these things which they are saying they are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd so um he is using the imagery over here of a shepherd who uses a rod you know to um to guide the sheep um 
if you remember in Psalm 23, it talks about the shepherd's staff and rod. You know, the staff is basically what he would be using you know, to, to walk with. Uh, but um, the rod is something uh, which will probably have a slightly sharp a a ending. You know, with, with maybe a nail attached to it or something, and he uses it to poke the sheep and force it to move in the right direction. Because sheep left to themselves will, will wander and drift wherever purposelessly, pointlessly. But the shepherd wants to keep them on track. So he uses the, the this goad, he uses this uh, rod to you know poke them and make them move in the right direction. So that is what this uh, teacher is doing throughout this book. He poses a series of questions and makes the person think, makes them ask themselves, all these things that are happening, what is the purpose? In which direction are things moving? What is God meaning to accomplish? Why is he permitting these things? Why does he allow those particular situations to take place? So there, there, are, there are many questions which the uh, teacher is kind of uh, urging his, his readers to start asking themselves. And then he admits that even though we do ask many questions, we may not have the answer to all of them. Uh, for instance, you know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, verses 1 and 2, he looks at how the rich are oppressing the poor. And he looks at the suffering that the poor are going through. And then he says to himself in his mind, the, bet the people who are dead are better off because at least they're not suffering. But the ones who are alive, uh, they experience suffering every day because of the, you know, of this rich and um, uh, evil people who are, uh, you know, oppressing the poor. And uh, so the question arises, why does God allow injustice? Why does God allow suffering? And uh, so after asking all of these questions, even though he's asking all of these questions, it leads him to one conclusion. And that is, you know, what we have read in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. There are certain things which we understand. There are some certain things which God himself explains to us. But to but nobody ever fully understands everything that God has done from beginning to end. Our understanding is limited. And he repeats this in various places in the book of Ecclesiastes. So in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 17, he repeats that same thing. He says, then I saw all that God has done no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can under, can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. You know, it's, it's what he says in Ecclesiastes 8.17. So he is talking about how life is a mystery how life cannot be completely fully known by us limited humans. So um, in all the places where he describes life as hevel, like vapor, he's not talking about the uselessness of life. He's not talking about the ineffectiveness, in ineffectiveness or the meaninglessness of life. He's talking about the mystery of life. So. If we were to actually translate this, uh, you know, uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 2 and Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, 8, the, you know, the opening statement and the closing statement in the correct way, uh, it would probably read like this. Mysterious, mysterious, says the teacher, utterly mysterious. Everything is mysterious. Uh, and, and another verse which brings out this concept is Ecclesiastes 1, 14. Uh, where uh, he says, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are hevel. You know, the term he uses over there. All of them are hevel. All of them are mysterious is what he's trying to convey. And he says, it's a chasing after the wind. So trying to fully understand life uh, is like chasing the wind. In the same way, you'll never really catch the wind. You will never fully grasp the entire understanding of everything that God has done and he is doing. So to an extent, we as humans will have to operate by faith where we just trust him 
to be sovereign. We trust him to be in charge and in control. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, he 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 makes this observation in Ecclesiastes 9.11 about how life operates um, uh, in nine, Ecclesiastes 9.11. Um, maybe if someone could read out that, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11. Again, I saw that under the sun, the lace is not for, to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the in, intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. Exactly. You know, it's such a very um, um, practical observation. I mean, we have all observed that. It's not always the strongest who win the battle. It's not always the wisest who are able to, uh, you know, acquire wealth and fame. Um, uh, just because a person is, uh, you know, uh, hardworking, it's not necessary that they are the ones who will be able to um, uh, gain money. Because time and chance happen to everyone. You know, so circumstances work out a certain way, and uh, the person may not really get what they had thought they would get. So time and chance happen to everyone. It's God who is in charge. It's God who determines how things would go for each person. Um, and so he he observes that even in Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 13 and 14, he says, you know, in Ecclesiastes 7, 13 and 14, he says, consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? And uh, then he says, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. So uh, ultimately, everything is under God's control. And God does not always provide us with an explanation of why he is doing what he is doing. So there are many things which are, le which are left um, not understood by us humans. You know, and we, we just have to trust God in these things, which is why, you know, coming back to Ecclesiastes 3, uh, verse 11 to verse 14. So in verse 11 is where he has, you know, told us uh, that God has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And then in verses 12 to 14, this is very simple word of advice that he gives us on how to face life. So like you know, we, we just saw now in the previous um, you know, passage, um, time and chance happens to everyone. No one can fully control all the events and circumstances of their life. Uh, we can plan, we can prepare, we can work hard. But ultimately, things are in the Lord's hands. And uh, so what should be our approach to life? How should we face this life? And so this is the advice that is given to us in verses 12, 13, and 14 about how we should approach life, how we should face life, because we are not in control. It's God who is in control. So he says, I know that there is nothing better for people than, you know, he basically talks about two things over here in uh, verse 12, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12. He says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy, and to do good while they live. So there are two things that he is suggesting here. He's saying, be happy with what, with what God has given you. You know, eat, drink, take joy and satisfaction in whatever it is that the Lord has given to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the New Testament equivalent of that would be Philippians 4, you know, where it says rejoice. And again, I say to you, rejoice. So. Be happy, be satisfied, be content with what the Lord is, you know, giving you on a daily basis. And second, do good. So these are the two basic things um, that we should, uh, these two uh, attitudes that we should uh, adopt uh, when we are approaching life. So in um, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 12, he says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. 
that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. And he repeats this again in other places. It's not, this is not the only place where he says this. And then in verse 14, he says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. So it's God who's in charge. It is God who is in control. And uh, once he decides uh, to do some particular thing, nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. And um, God operates in the sovereign manner that people may fear him, is what he says. Now, this word that is used over there, the Hebrew word uh, fear, yare, that would be the Hebrew word. It has both positive and uh, negative connotations. Now, uh, if you take that word negatively, it would refer to us being scared of somebody. Of, of you know, it would refer to us being afraid of somebody. But in a positive sense, that word is talking about us uh, literally standing in front of someone in awe. You know, where we are just amazed at how how much how beyond our understanding that person is. You know, so we, we stand in awe before God and um, we respect who he is. He's beyond our understanding. He's much greater. He, his thoughts are much more beautiful than what we can, uh, you know, imagine our, in our own limited thinking. So God operates in this sovereign manner where he doesn't explain every little detail to us. He operates in this manner so that we would learn to trust him and fear him so that should be our attitude uh, you know in facing this um, uh, this life and um, so uh, therefore you know in line with this the teacher gives this advice at the end of the book he says in ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14 uh, he says now all has been heard here is the conclusion of the matter fear god and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So, you know, basically, he's repeating what he had earlier said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where he told us that we should be happy and we should also do good. So, he's, he's, you know, in, in his conclusion, he again reminds and says, you know, don't forget to do good. Keep the God, keep the Lord's commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind, he says, because God is watching with what attitude we are living out this life, which we don't fully understand. Happened to us, which we did not expect. We assumed that we would uh, that our life would go in a certain direction, but you know, life turns in a different direction. So when, when all of these things are happening to us, God is watching and seeing with what attitude we are you know, approaching these sudden changes, um, whether we continue to trust him and fear him or whether we become bitter and grumble the way the Israelites did in the wilderness. Okay, so Because the, when the Israelites walked out of Egypt, they expected their future to go in a particular way. You know, that even as they're walking or marching out of Egypt, God is going to go before them and there's going to be only victory, no hardships, no difficulties, uh, no, no Red Seas coming in the way. They expected things to go in a particular way. And then when, when there were days when there was no water, they began to grumble and said, oh, why did God bring us out here? He must have brought us out over here to die. You know, so they spoke very badly about God, about the character of God. And uh, so we are being told in this book of Ecclesiastes, do not distrust this God. Um, uh, it says he will judge every hidden thing. So even if a person has, you know, maybe only inside their heart grumbled against him and not really said anything out outwardly, God knows our hearts. So uh, it says, be careful in everything that you do. So whether it is good or evil, it will be judged. So if what you have thought of God is good, if you have continued to trust him and hold on to him, your reward will be great. On the other hand, if you have been uh, um, evil in the things which you have thought and which you have done, 
then you know you would not get a reward you would rather instead lose out on the um, on the on the prize which god had wanted to give you and uh, so how would we apply this book to you know in in the new testament context in which we are living there are some questions mentioned in this book which get answered in the new testament so in the old testament the people did not have an answer to those particular questions you know some of the questions which the teacher raises in the book of ecclesiastes there was no answer to those questions at that time um, we, we will look at just one small uh, example um, ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 ecclesiastes 2 15 and 16 if someone could read out please So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this is also in his vanity. Uh, verse sixteen. Oh, sorry. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die as the fool? so over here uh, the observation that the uh, teacher makes is that whether i am wise or whether i am a fool i will die both the wise wise man and the fool both of them ultimately die that is their fate so in what way does the wise man gain you know by being wise um, is the question which is asked but then um, when we come to the new testament we know that there is hope even beyond death okay so there was not much clarity in the old testament given to the people about all the events and things which would happen to us after death uh, in the new testament we are explained you know we are told these things in great detail so we have so much more clarity so yes in the old, in the new testament we can say with confidence oh there's a great difference between living as a fool and living as a wise person if we are a fool if we go against the things of god and we live however we wish and you know we we sin and we we rebel against god uh, even though you know we may get away with it during the lifetime after death there will definitely be a final judgment um and there would be a punishment so um on the other hand if we have led godly lives if we have trusted him uh, held on to him uh, even during hard times unlike the israelites we did not grumble against him but we continued being faithful we didn't run after golden calves and other idols but we stayed faithful to him if we have done that then after death there is a great reward awaiting us and uh, paul brings out this so beautifully in first corinthians 15 Verses nineteen to twenty-one. First Corinthians fifteen nineteen to twenty-one. He says, "If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied." You know, if if the only hope that we have from God is just for this for the seventy or eighty years that we are alive, then it's we are to be pitied. But no, our hope doesn't just. it's not just restricted to the seventy or eighty years. Whether you know those those seventy or eighty years are going well. whether we were able to gain money whether we were able to gain some amount of fame or uh, some amount of comfort our uh, hope is not restri uh, restricted to the events of this 70 or 80 years our hope goes beyond death and so he says um if only for this life we have hope in christ we are of all people most to be pitied because it's not really much of a hope but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, and he goes on to say in verse twenty-one, uh, "The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, that is through Jesus." So he's saying we have a resurrected life to look forward to. We have a great reward to look forward to. There's so much awaiting us on the other side of death. So in the Old Testament times, people did, were not really aware of. what more is there once death happens so here the question one of the questions which the teacher raises is he says where's the point the fool dies the wise man also dies so where's the point 
But now we know in the New Testament that there definitely is a clear point. So in, the, in, in this way, there are some questions which are raised in the book of Ecclesiastes, which are very clearly answered in the New Testament. But even now, even as we are living in the New Testament times, we still have many questions which have not been fully answered. God has not provided explanations. And it's only in eternity that we will actually find out the answers to those questions. So in the meantime, just like the Old Testament people, we too are expected to fear the Lord and keep his commandments. We are, we are called upon to trust the Lord and walk in faith, even though we may not understand you know, all the details. Um, so it ultimately comes down to, to these two things, you know, which, um, uh, which um, the teacher asks us, in, asks us to do in um, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 12, where he says, uh, you know, um, be happy and do good. So rejoice, like it says in Philippians 4, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Continue to be, uh, to trust in God. Hold on to him. Uh, place your petitions before him with thanksgiving and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. So, you know, be happy. And second, do good. Walk in the ways of God, even when nothing makes sense and everything is going against you, continue to be faithful to him. And so if we do these things, then, you know, whether we have fully understood the mystery of life or whether we have not fully understood the mystery of life, our life which is ultimately in, in God's control, will go in the direction it is meant to. Because, you know, that's the promise which, uh, uh, which, which um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the teacher offers us in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 14. He says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. So what he has planned for you and your life, it will uh, take place if you walk with him. If you follow his directions, nobody will be able to stop those things from taking place because what God has once what God has decided, it will come to pass. He is sovereign. He is in control. So from our side, we are expected to just continue to trust him and hold on to him. So um, you know, in Ecclesiastes five eighteen, you know, I'm just repeating whatever I have said earlier. In Ecclesiastes five eighteen. Um, yeah, if um, one of you can mute yourselves, I can hear some. Yeah, just just if, if yeah. So in Ecclesiastes five eighteen, uh, this is what he says. Um, uh, Ecclesiastes five eighteen. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor. Uh, you know, and he goes on to say, for this is their lot. And then in Ecclesiastes 8, 12, he says, although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. So uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, we who are living in this fallen world and going through all kinds of unexpected um, you know, turnings, um, in our life, new directions which we never even expected. One thing is for sure, he says, it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. And uh, so the God who is in charge, uh, he will work out things in his sovereignty, uh, you know, as and when he has planned. So uh, this book of Ecclesiastes forces us to ask honest, honest questions you know so when we are going through trials and difficulties we may ask questions like you know um, why is god allowing this and if god has allowed this is he being fair is he being just so you see all these wisdom books are going into a deeper level uh, which is why they actually call them wisdom books in the book of Job. Um, and then you have the Psalms and you have the Proverbs. And now here we are looking at Ecclesiastes. All of these books are looking at the deeper things where honest questions are being raised, you know, and uh, uh, the, the, the psalmist in the, in the Psalms, he cries out and says, Lord, 
why have you you know why are you not hearing the cry of my heart and uh, here in in ecclesiastes again this person is asking you know why does god permit the things he does so very honest frank questions are being raised and at all times the writer may not have answers but one thing comes through the writer always says continue to trust in god because god is in charge and god will take care and what he's meant to fulfill he will do in his timing okay so it always comes back to this one uh, one main thing um so um the conclusion at the end of the book of ecclesiastes is whether we can whether we have understood the mystery of life fully or not um, the duty of all mankind is that we must fear god in the sense of respecting him and also in the in the sense of trusting him so that word fear over here is talking about trust and it's also talking about um you know respecting him and allowing him to be sovereign where we are not grumbling and saying lord you should do do things my way no we respect him and say lord you do things your way you be god i'll be human i will submit to you and in your timing lord i will see even if i don't see it on this earth on the other side of death you know when i'm in when i'm walking around strutting around happily in my resurrected body that day i will be i will see how beautifully you worked out every little detail and brought it all together to make my life what it is okay so we can have that certain hope in the lord uh, so that is what ecclesiastes is teaching us the right attitude towards to have towards this life which is like such a mystery so difficult to understand but the one who is above all who the one who is above the sun you know under the sun we don't have clarity but above the sun the one who is ruling over all he has perfect clarity and he knows exactly um you know, what he is doing with our lives so uh, let's just close with a word of prayer we thank you oh lord for books like this for for the book of job for the book of uh, psalms proverbs uh, and uh, this book of ecclesiastes lord in these books you are very clearly allowing us giving us a chance to frankly express the thoughts and questions and doubts that are there in our hearts and your answer to us is um, that our minds are limited and if we can just look to you and fear you respect you and trust you then you who are sovereign will cause things to go in the direction that you have fixed because like the uh, writer has said in ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 verse 14 what you have considered o lord you will bring to pass nothing can be added to it nothing can be removed from it so we are safe and secure in your hand so lord as long as we follow you as long as we submit to you and as long as uh, we are always having that trusting attitude towards you so we thank you o lord uh, and we commit our future into your hands we commit the future of our families into your hands even as we continue to walk in your ways you take care of us o lord and you protect us and you lead and guide us thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much for you know staying throughout the class yes